Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bible Study. I'm R.K. Brown, and I'm glad to be with you. Well, I'm sure that many of you, probably all of you that watch me regularly, and anybody who might just happen to accidentally tune in, although with God there is nothing accidental or coincidental or incidental, you know, if you're watching me, God brought you here. So, um, you've heard about what went on this week with Target, where a lot of mothers around the country were outraged because they go into the swimsuit area and they find all this trans, LGBTQ, ABCD, W, X, Y, Z, whatever, plus, plus, minus, equals. And they saw all this stuff written on these these baby clothes, this trans, these trans messages written on these baby clothes and, you know, tuck swimsuits and you, you go figure out what that means yourself. I'm not going to talk about that. It's disgusting. And uh, so Target, praise the Lord, last I heard a couple of days ago has lost $9 billion in their stock portfolio because well in their stock price not their stock portfolio but their stock prices and uh I'm glad to hear it you know but uh you know if the, if they'd take all that stuff out and apologize then I'd be okay with saying hey you know go shop at target but you know and you know the bud light effect has taken hold of target and I'm glad to see it I'm going to move my mouse pointer so that it won't be in my way when I'm reading when I read scripture I'm glad to see it. So, um, you know, basically the, the people that protest Bud Light because they put Dylan Mulvaney on the, on, the, uh, <clears throat> on the can of Bud Light are saying, apologize, Bud Light, apologize, Anheuser-Busch, and we'll go back to buying your products. But we want an apology. And Anheuser-Busch instead doesn't apologize. They just go make a 9-11 video trying to appeal to the patriotic people of, of the country. They make a, like some kind of cowboy video to try to appeal to the masculine men of the country. And it ain't working, Bud Light. Ain't nobody having it. Apologize or lose your butt, financially speaking. And then Target, you know, has all this LGBT nonsense on their children's clothing and people are getting sick of it but what i want to tell you today in my message is that there's nothing new under the sun this kind of thing has gone on before you saw the name of the message maybe when you when i first turned it on if you're just kind of tuning in the name of the message is sorry the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a cry there, and I'm going to show you why there is a cry. There was a cry in Sodom and Gomorrah. A cry. There was a crying out in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord heard it, and he wasn't having it. So let's go look at something. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 tells us, The thing that hath been is that which is to be. And that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So when we, as Bible people, say something like, there's no new thing under the sun, somebody's liable to say, well, there's all kind of new things under the sun. I mean, we have the internet, we have cars, we have computers, we have airplanes, we have Bitcoin, we have every kind of new thing. Yeah. Technically, yes, there are new things under the sun, but as far as human nature goes, there is no new thing under the sun. That which is past has already been. You know? I mean, that which is to come has already been, and that which is past is now, as we will see later. So he said again, the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. So the answer to the question is, is there anything that, you know, is new? No, there's nothing as concerning human nature that is new. <clears throat> and in verse 11, there is no remembrance of former things, neither shall thou be 
any shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. And I kind of ask myself, what did Solomon mean by that? Now I think the Lord provided the answer. Just kind of just kind of made me know the answer. And the answer is that history repeats itself, or at least it rhymes very strongly. The same thing happens over and over again. I, I suppose you could say that the Bible is saying that history does repeat itself, right? So nobody remembers the things that have happened before. People kind of know about them. You know, people kind of know about the, you know, all the stuff that was going on in Berlin before, before the Nazis took over. And, you know, the one thing the Nazis actually did right, the only thing that Nazis actually did right is they cleaned up Berlin. But uh, other than that, you know, they're wicked people. I'm not, I'm not praising the Nazis. But, but they cleaned up Berlin. So all this stuff has gone on throughout history. Everybody knows, you know, any, any kind of historical-minded person knows about Pompeii. And, of course, everybody knows about Sodom and Gomorrah. These things have happened before. And... God exacts judgment. And sometimes, like he did with Jerusalem and, and Judea, with Nebuchadnezzar, he sends wicked men to do his work. And he called the Lord called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. And actually, I do believe that Nebuchadnezzar was actually saved. I refer you to Daniel chapter 4. But nevertheless, at the time... Nebuchadnezzar was not saved when he came in on Jerusalem, but he was still the Lord's servant. God called him my servant. And so God sometimes sends evil men to exact punishment on, especially on his people, but on evil, you know. And in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah and Pompeii, I guess they were so wicked that God did it by external means. Like uh, Pompeii was destroyed utterly by a volcano and Sodom and Gomorrah, I don't think there are any volcanoes in the region, so God just sent fire and brimstone down from heaven. You know, I don't know if I don't know if it's possible that maybe he caused a volcano to erupt somewhere else in the world and it, the stuff went all the way up in the atmosphere and came down on Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know that. The Bible doesn't say that, but he said the Bible says that he rained fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. So this thing that the Sodomites are doing now is nothing new. They're going after the children. Back in about 1996, not long after I got to Nashville, I got a robocall from some ministry that I had never heard of, and they gave a warning, and then they played a recording of some sodomite saying, we are coming after your sons. We will get your sons. And, of course, I was like, you won't get my son I was ready to I was ready to pounce, you know. And uh but that's what they're doing now. They're going for your children. They're doing drag queen story time in schools, there are pornographic books in schools. They're you know, they've you know, in some schools they've allowed uh homosexuals to come in and teach children about anal sex and all kind of sex toys and stuff like that. It's disgusting. But they're coming for the children because we didn't Stop them. It's the fault of the men in this country. It's the fault of the preachers for not preaching Jesus correctly. The preachers in the pulpits of America are often preaching to people a kind of a, you got to give your heart to Jesus. And it kind of implies that you've got to change your life and give your life to Jesus. When the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, put your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, God will change you. But I believe that preachers in the country are actually telling people that they need to live a better life in order to be saved. I believe they're kind of doing it subtly, and maybe they're not even aware of what they're doing, but they are. And the Bible tells us that the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that God raised him the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and rose the third day. That's the gospel. That's what you must put your trust in. And when you put your trust in, we sing in the Baptist churches all the time, just as I am, when a pastor does an altar call. 
We sing in the Baptist churches, just as I am, without one plea. I don't have a plea to come to you, Lord, except have mercy on me, a sinner, like the publican did when he went into the temple to pray. And so I believe the pastors of America are doing a great disservice by giving people the idea that they have to somehow turn over a new leaf and they talk about asking Jesus into your heart. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says believe, that when you believe. Actually, and I quote this verse all the time. It's a super amazing verse. Ephesians 1, 13, something like, uh, After that ye believed, you were sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. After you believe, Jesus came into your heart. The Bible doesn't say, ask Jesus into your heart. Jesus gave a clear example of somebody not even willing to look up to heaven, but smote upon his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's how you get saved, by asking God to have mercy on you, not by turning over a new leaf. And Jesus will send his spirit that will come into you and seal you, save you. And then God will begin to work on you to correct your life. But you don't correct your life to come to Jesus. You don't ask Jesus into your heart. You don't accept Christ. You believe the gospel message. That's how you're saved. And I believe that because of the pastors in this country are preaching the gospel wrong, and I believe that because the men of this country haven't stood up to things like feminism and stuff like that, that the country has gone insane. The Bible, you know, in according to uh, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, it's a curse when women rule over you. And that's basically what's kind of happening now. I'm not knocking on women at all. I love women. I have women in my life that I love. Three of them that I can think of right off the bat. And, and two of them are my mother and my daughter. And uh, so... Women are wonderful. Women are just as valuable as men. But God has set an order to the family, and it is that men should lead the household, and it is that men should rule over society. Because remember, the scriptures in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12 said, you know, that women rule over, or children are their oppressors, and women rule over them, and they that lead them cause my people to err. Right? So, it's not good. And other men, the, the worst part about it is other men are enforcing feminism with guns, police officers, judges, govern, governments, governors, legislators. Men are enforcing feminism. And it ain't right. And that has brought about this other thing. Women will get close to to sodomize because they feel safe with them. They, they, they can hang out with a dude and, you know, maybe it might be that the dude can protect them. They kind of feel safe. But they also feel safe that the man is not going to hit on them because he don't like women. So women will, will befriend a sodomite. And it has brought about what we see in our society now. And the sodomites have gotten so emboldened that now they are going for our children. And we better not be having it. Now let me stop. Let me pause right here and say something real quick to the censors. To the Facebook fact checkers. Or censors as I think of them. If you have any fear of God, and I know you're watching because even when I post a video that is uh, that I put that only I can see, I see that I'll get two or three views. So I know there's some censors around the world watching this video. So I'm saying to you censors, you quote-unquote fact checkers, if you have any fear of God in you at all, don't take down my video. I'm going to show you in the end that, well, if you take down my video, then you're complicit in what's going on in, the, in our country, in, in the United States, and in the world, where these sodomites are trying to now go for our children. If you take down my video, you're complicit with it. So do as you will. Do 
according to the thor- the authority that you have to let it slide or let it go by or you know to let it slide or take it down it's up to you but i'm appealing to you that if you have any fear of god at all leave my video alone so we're going to start with the story of abraham i'm not going to get into all the details so basically the lord and it's capital l o r d it's the uh the oh what's it called again uh, the Oh, gosh, I can't think of the word right now. Sometimes I'm, when I'm in the throes of preaching, I can't. The tetragrammaton is the word for Jehovah, and it's always uh, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the Old Testament. And the reason it is is because when Jesus Christ himself quoted the Old Testament, that's the way he said it, capital O or capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And so the translators of the King James Bible didn't translate it into Jehovah most of the time unless they needed to for clarity. They translated it as the Lord from the Tetragrammaton. So um, the Lord, which I believe is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, comes to Abraham with two other men, which are actually angels, and so we pick up the story there. I'm going to skip over some detail that is not pertinent to this particular lesson. And I'll move on through it. So I'll show you where I skip and everything. Genesis 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of, what is that? Memory. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. And he set in a tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. Okay, so we're going to skip some verses here. So three men come to him, and it's the Lord. If you if you read the if you read all the scripture that I'm going to skip over for not needing to be in this lesson, you'll see, you'll see that it's the Lord. You'll see that the tetragrammaton is used, and it might even be used here in a minute. So let's jump over some verses and come to verse 16. And the men rose up from thence. Now now they've had their meal. They've prophesied to Abraham. They prophesied to Sarah that she's going to have a child. Sarah laughed, and, <laughs> and they said, why did Sarah laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. And they said, no, oh, you laughed. So we're going to pick up after that. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. And the Lord said, right? Now you see the tetragrammaton, Jehovah. That means Jehovah. And the Lord said. So it's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. And I've often thought that when Abraham saw them coming, like he ran to meet them, I've often wondered if that's Melchizedek because Abraham recognized the Lord, you know. And I don't know if Melchizedek is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus or not. A lot of people think so. A lot of people think not. But it sure seems crazy to me that Abraham recognized them and ran to them. And the way he talked to them, like Abraham was a mighty man with lots of cattle and he had already, you know, gone and whipped all those kingdoms that took Lot captive back in, I believe, Revelation 13. And um, Abraham was a very powerful man. And God had blessed him abundantly. But yet when he sees these, th these three men, he runs to them and bows to them and calls one of them thy servant. Right? So we see now that the Tetragrammaton is used. It's the Lord. It's Jehovah. Like, that's what the Scripture says. And the Lord. 
and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, The Lord, remember, it's the Tetragrammaton, Jehovah, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, or however that is uh, pronounced, you know? The Tetragrammaton, God. And the Lord said, Because the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. Let me read the first part of that to you again, because it's the title of our lesson. And God, the Lord, said, Behold, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which came unto me, and if not, I will know. So there's a cry in Sodom, a crying out in Sodom, in Gomorrah. There is something going on there that's causing people to cry out. So who is this that's crying out? I'll tell you in a second. So we're going to go to Genesis 19 now where the so the, the two men are going to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord's going to stay there with Abraham and talk to him and the two men are going to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. The two angels. They are angels. And I, I heard somebody say this morning that angels uh, are neither male nor female. Well, every account of the Bible says that angels are male, masculine. There's no female angel like on Touched by an Angel or any kind of thing like that. Angels are always masculine, and they appear to people as men, not women. Now, obviously, the Bible says that, uh, you know, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels in heaven. Well, there's no sodomy in heaven. If angels are masculine, they don't marry, nor do they given, nor are they given in marriage, right? So, let's move on. Genesis 19, 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even. See, they're angels. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now remember, at this point, Lot doesn't know that they're angels. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered in to his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house, Round, uh, com compass the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Now, how do you think those young people got corrupted like that? They got corrupted by the older people. That's the cry. They got corrupted probably when they were children. And this is what this lesson is all about. There's nothing new under the sun. There's all this stuff that's going on with Bud Light and Target and all the drag queen story time hour and all the sodomites coming into the schools and all the, the homosexual pornography that's in the libraries of the schools and the teachers 
trying to tell your children, your little kids who are very vulnerable and confusable, that, oh, maybe you're a boy when they're actually a girl, or maybe you're a girl when they're actually a boy. They're coming after the children, and there's nothing new. The cry in Sodom was the children crying out for what was being done to them. And then they're given over to it. At some point, they're given over to reprobation, and then there's no turning back for them. There are some people that are molested as a child that turn away from it, and they have no dealings with it. It probably messes with them all their life, but they're not homosexuals. They are saved, some of them. Some people are saved that have been molested as children because they didn't, because God didn't give them over to a reprobate mind because they didn't want that. They knew it was wrong. They didn't want it, and God didn't give it over to them, and they want God. And so God didn't give them over to a reprobate mind. But the cry that was in Sodom, that the Lord, that God, the Lord, the Tetragrammaton, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah, talked about was that the older ones were corrupting the younger ones. And that's why you see old and young pounding on Lot's door. Verse 5, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after them and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they unto the shadow of my roof. I don't for the life of me know why Lot would have said that. And he also called them brothers. You know, brothers do not so wickedly. Let me see if I can find that again. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray ye, brethren, they're not your brothers, Lot. They're wicked reprobates. They're not your brethren. So Lot made a great mistake right there by calling them brethren. And Lot also, I, I just can't even believe that he would say, I'll send my virgin daughters out to you. And there is a story in Judges 19 that is a very similar story where they actually did send the woman out. And they abused her all night that she died. And I'm not even going to begin to tell you how I think that happened. But so Lot was willing to send his daughters out where I would have said, all right, boys, y'all came into the city. Y'all were going to stay out there all night. I, I'm sure Lot warned them that it was a dangerous place, no doubt. You know, I'm not trying to put words in the mouth of the Bible, but I'm pretty sure that Lot warned them of the dangers of the city, and that's why they finally agreed to go in the house. Well, besides that, they had already planned on saving him out of the city. But, so, I would have said, boys, I'm sorry that y'all walked into this situation like this, but I warned y'all about this city. This is a bad place. Y'all should have not even come here. I'm sure you've heard the reputation of it outside the city. Y'all should have never came in this place. But now we're going to have to fight. If these dudes are planning on taking y'all, I'll fight with you. But we're going to have to fight. There's no way on God's green earth, or God's blue earth, because <laughs> most of it's blue with water, there's no way on this earth that I would send my sweet Jessica out to something like that. Ain't no way, no how, no way. Boys, we're going to have to fight. But there's no way I'd send my sweet daughter out into something like that. And I don't understand for the life of me why that happened twice in the Bible where they offered to send out the women. I don't understand it. it it's just crazy to me. And just because Lot, who was a righteous man, did that doesn't mean it was a righteous thing. You see, all the time in the Scripture, righteous people doing unrighteous things. And that 
was a pretty darn wicked thing that Lot did. But God had mercy on him. I'm telling you, there's no way. I can't imagine a man doing that. That blows my mind. I would fight and die before I'd send my sweet baby girl out into some situation like that. Good night almighty. Golly. Wow. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes only. Unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they unto the shadow of my roof. So check out what the men of Sodom say. And they said, Stand back! They said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man even Lot, and came near to break the door. Let me park right here for a second. Verse 9 again, After that they said, Stand back, and they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Yeah, he was a judge, because their deeds were wicked. When Jesus said, judge not that ye be not judged, he's saying, why would you say to your brother, let me remove that, that plank out of your eye, or, or that, uh, that moat out of your eye, that speck, sorry. Let me remove that moat out of your eye when you have a plank in your own eye to your brother to your Christian brother. He's saying, don't judge. Romans chapter 2 makes this very clear. If you go read the beginning of Romans chapter 2, it makes it very clear. You know, why do you, you know, if you judge those that, if you judge those and you're doing the same thing that they're doing, do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God? That's what Jesus is saying. Judge not that ye be not judged. But he's talking about judging your brother, your Christian brother. Everybody in the world is not your brother. Everybody in the world are not children of God. The scripture says that we are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That we're children of God by adoption according to Ephesians chapter 1. So, Lot was wrong for calling them brothers and he was wrong for being willing to send his daughter out into that mess. Golly, that just blows my mind. But the angels took care of the situation because they reached out and pulled Lot into the house. And then, but the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were, so that they wearied themselves to find the door both small and great. Now, does he mean small in stature and great in stature, like children, young men, and old men? Probably. Small and great could mean, it could mean the, the rich and the poor. But, you know, in the context, it looks like he's talking about young and old. And he smote them with blindness that they groped for the door. That, to me, seems to be a picture of reprobation. That is a, uh, you know, a type and shadow of reprobation, if you will. He smote them with blindness. Now they couldn't see. And then he destroyed them. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. So, I told you earlier... In the very beginning of the lesson, I told you, the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which, or I'm sorry, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. There's nothing new in human nature under the sun. And also, there's nothing new with God under the sun. God doesn't change. Jesus Christ, yesterday, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. You know, how's it say in, in James chapter 1, let them pray unto the Father of lights who, oh, uh, let me think about what I'm trying to say here. Um, 
Oh, yeah. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no veritableness, neither shadow of turning. God doesn't change. So, this is what we see. So, remember I just showed you there's, there's nothing new under the sun in human nature. That which has been done is that which is going to be done. And also, oh, I showed you there's no remembrance of it, and that's why history repeats itself. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can, but, nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Now, when I was a Calvinist, I was taught that that meant that, you know, God has ordained all events and blah, 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 blah. And I'm not saying that God hasn't ordained all events because God knows everything and he knew everything before he set the world in motion. But that's not what that means. That which is past is now, and that which is to come hath already been, and it's with God. In other words, you can read the Bible and you can know what God is going to do in a certain situation because God doesn't change. That which is past, I know whatsoever thing God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which is past is now, and that which is to come hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. So God doesn't change. So there's nothing new with human nature, and there's nothing new with God. So you can read the Bible. Because that's the only way that you can know what God does. And if you're born again, if you're saved, if you're a spirit-filled person, I don't mean like the Charismatics and Pentecostals. I mean that if you've been sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise after you believed, then God will show you the Scriptures. God speaks the same to everyone. You know, how does it say in Hebrews chapter 1 that God in various ways and at sundry times speaks spake to the fathers through the prophets, but now hath in these last days spoken to us through his Son, by whom he also made the worlds. And so he did speak in old time through the prophets, but now anybody that says they're a prophet is a false prophet because God speaks the same to everybody because we have the Bible. And whatsoever thing God doeth, I know that whatsoever thing God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can, be, nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. So there's no new thing under the heavens with men, and there's no new thing under the heavens with God. And by that I mean human nature and God's nature. I don't mean computers and airplanes and all that kind of stuff, right? I ain't talking about that. So, having said that, we go to Jude, the only chapter in Jude. So we go to verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, God giving... Uh, <clears throat> He's talking about the false prophets. Jude is talking about the false prophets. And men who are crept in unaware, like they snuck into the church with their false nonsense. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. These people who are going after our children are going to suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. There's no question about it. The Bible just said that, that, that Sodom and Gomorrah, the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah is an example to those who are doing the same things, who are doing that same stuff. And then 2 Peter chapter 2, which is basically a synonymous chapter. It's a kind of synoptic. It's synonymous and it looks it looks synonymous, right? Very, very, you know, they're parallel chapters. And Peter says this, also talking about the false teachers. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, 
a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample, which means example, unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot. Remember, we're talking about Lot here and his dealing with the men of Sodom. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing, in hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the ungodly unto the day of judgment to be punished. And God did deliver Lot out of his temptation or his trial. Temptation means trial. He delivered him out of his trial. Brought him and his wife and his daughters out of the city. And then his wife looked back because I did a lesson about Lot's wife. Go watch that. I won't even go into it right now. Go watch it. Lot's wife. And um, Sodom and Gomorrah and the overthrow of the destruction, the turning thereof into ashes, is an example or an ensample, as Peter said, to generations who live afterwards. And God is going to do something about this. He's not going to tolerate it forever. He might let America be overthrown, but he's not going to tolerate what these sodomites are doing forever. Stand up to this, definitely with your money, Definitely with your money. Don't give money to people that hate you. I used to I used to go to Starbucks very often, you know, and then I kind of got sick of going in there and always seeing some some tranny or you know just some real effeminate dudes or something like that. You know, the women are always kind of normal, but the dudes are always like real effeminate and. And there was this tranny that worked in one of them. And, you know, I was never rude to anybody, but I got sick of it. Got sick of going in there. And then after Roe versus Wade was overturned, then uh, the owner of Starbucks said that he was going to start paying for abortions for women who, you know, got pregnant out of wedlock and whatever, or even, I guess, in wedlock, whatever, if they wanted to go to another state where it was legal that they would pay for it and even pay for, well, they'd pay for the travel and the abortion. And I've said, man, I've had enough. I'm out on Starbucks and I don't drink, so I'm already out on Bud Light and any Anheuser-Busch product. I already don't drink. And I already kind of was boycotting Target, kind of, because they already had that transgender bathroom issue, right? And, you know, I'm not, I ain't down with that, man. I, it ain't right for some dude to be going in where some little girl's using the bathroom. It's not right, and it shouldn't be taking place in our country. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. It's ungodly. It's wicked. Stop it. So that's my lesson. Now you know why there was the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you're watching by Facebook, well, let's see. If you're watching by Facebook, YouTube, Gab TV, Gab Social, Rumble, Truth Social, BitChute. And I don't actually upload to uh, Gab anymore. It's just, it's, I, I hate it because it's probably the coolest of the of the uh, sites like that, of the social media sites. But I've just had more technical trouble with them. It's just kind of ridiculous. And it's, it's just, I've just kind of had enough of it. And they, they cut me off for a long time because they... You know, my my, per, my subscription, my prescription, my subscription ran out and it was real difficult to pay for another year of subscription. And I finally did it, but I lost a lot of viewership in the in the interim time of trying to figure it out. So, you know, when my subscription ran out this time, I'm just like, I'm, I'm out. I, I, I give up. I give up. Y'all, sorry. Sorry. So you can watch some of my older videos on Gab TV and Gab Social, but not this one. So anyway. I hope that you got something out of it. 
I hope the Facebook censors or YouTube censors or any other censor that what, whatever platform I might be on with this, I hope nobody takes this down. It's an important video. You know, I know it's a, you know, sort of a, it probably seems sort of um, arrogant of me to say, a video I just did is an important video, but it's not because I did it. It's because it's the Word of God. I have taught you truthfully the Word of God. So take it, run with it, tell others about it. Make a comment. If you hate the message, make a comment. Just be nice or otherwise I'll take your comment down. Don't troll me. And uh, like and subscribe. All right. Good night. God bless you. I'll see you, Lord willing, next week.